Thank you. Thank you. My journey here began with a journalistic assignment I did not want to take. I'd written for my employer, The Atlantic Monthly, on a range of topics, work, money, family, public education, elder care, China. There's a lot going on in China. <laughs> but when my editor suggested I write about menopause, I went, ew. <laughs> menopause, it seemed creepy, sad, gynecological. <laughs> No more eggs, because you're old, you're dry, really dry, down there. <laughs> Thus the dropped libido. As a female writer of a certain age, I wasn't sure I wanted to be associated with such an unsexy and potentially depressing topic. But the demographics of menopause were startling. As of 2015 already, due to increasing female longevity, America had reached a tipping point where, wait for it, almost one out of every two American women no longer had periods. <gasps> right, almost one in two, that's 50 million women, were literally the largest swarm of menopausal women in history. <laughs> right, you know. So clearly this was gonna be huge, so I decided to research menopause as a kind of helpful societal information project. And here's what I found. First, quick history of menopause. I note I did say history, not herstory. Thank you for that, because from the ancient Greeks on, it was mostly men who wrote about it. So in the Middle Ages, male physicians deemed menopause a nervous disorder, <laughs> where a woman ceased to exist for the species and resembled a dethroned queen. Ah. In the 1800s, the first complete book on menopause was written by a British physician named Sir Edward Kilt. He categorized menopause as a disease with 137 different symptoms. <laughs> Interesting things like pseudo-narcolepsy, <laughs> temporary deafness, convenient. Uncontrollable peevishness, oh no. <laughs> and my favorite, wait for it, hysterical flatulence. <laughs> what kind of flatulence is there? Lusty flatulence, passive aggressive flatulence. <laughs> Fast forward to 1900, where in the US, the average lifespan of a US citizen was, anyone know? 48 years old, right. So most menopausal women were in fact dead, dead right. <laughs> it's not ideal, but at least you'll finally sleep through the night. <laughs> Joke for my menopausal sisters, thank you. But in 2001, <laughs> the story changes. It's because for the first time, a woman is telling it. Christiane Northrup, MD, in her fantastic book, the wisdom of menopause. Okay. So the old narrative about menopause was that menopause is the change, right? When a woman is fertile, she's a lovely, attractive, useful person. <laughs> but then suddenly those eggs go and she changes into a monster, you know? And shortly thereafter dies. But chronologically, that's not even true anymore. As opposed to dying at 48, today women live much longer into their 80s, 90s, and beyond. You know, pretty recently, the oldest person in America was a 116-year-old woman, right? right? So because we live so much longer, and we're only fertile that middle 25, 30 years of our lives, that middle third of our lives, the change isn't menopause, it's fertility. Right? That's when the fertility cloud comes down and you change, right? I mean, that's when an 11-year-old girl, who's much the same as an 11-year-old boy, just as stinky and selfish and irresponsible, <laughs> when that prepubescent girl 
turns 12 and 13, and the fertility cloud comes down. And she starts thinking about boys and hair and makeup and smelling good. You know, and then that girlfriend becomes a wife and a mother, and mom starts nurturing and supporting and putting other people's needs before her own. <laughs> Like a Stepford wife, she starts cutting up little sandwiches and folding socks. There's a, you know, there's a family who's sensibly relaxing around her. <laughs> then in one day in her late 40s, there mom stands, cutting up little sandwiches. And the fertility cloud begins to lift. And as if in a dream, the woman noticed her, herself cutting up little sandwiches for all these able-bodied people. <laughs> who are now 11 feet tall. And she asked herself, why am I cutting up these effing little sandwiches, you know? You should cut up your own effing sandwiches. And she starts hurling the sandwiches, you know. You know and, and the whole family goes, whoa, scary. Mom's going through the chain. <laughs> but menopause isn't the change. It's the return to who you were before the fertility cloud came down. In fact, in fact, scientifically speaking, this is interesting, in menopause, a woman's hormone levels go back to where they were when she was a preteen girl. So, you know, this is an interesting tale. You know, like, here you are, almost 50, newly girlish, and you may have almost half of your life ahead of you. I mean, huzzah! That's awesome, I thought, like, <laughs> right? Menopause is this cool, cool thing. Why aren't more people, maybe 50 million people, talking about how cool it is? And then I realized, you know, to truly celebrate menopause, we're going to have to challenge and transform some of society's most deeply held narratives about women of all ages. Narratives maybe we didn't always come up with ourselves. For instance, the conventional wisdom about menopause was that in menopause, a woman's libido drops. <laughs> and you're thinking, when was my libido high? <laughs> I was pregnant, breastfeeding, driving toddlers to Gymboree, or <laughs> weekly date night, you know, God. You know, by contrast, when I started having the menopause conversation, I was amazed at how many women in their 50s and 60s came to me wanting to talk about all the sex they were having <laughs> in language that was really, really joyously blue, you know, almost like they were discovering sex for the first time. And at first, I was surprised but then it started to make sense. Finally, in these women's lives, they had their own money, their own places. If their marriages were stagnant, they'd ended them, right? The kids were up and out. They finally had time to take care of themselves, to relax and have fun and maybe experiment, you know. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> By contrast, the 25-year-old young women I know, they're not talking about sex. They're talking about careers and jobs and finding a car that runs and an apartment without fleas, you know. They may have sex, but they have to worry about birth control. Why? Because they're full of eggs. <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility managing the eggs, carrying the eggs, you know, right? You know, you know, right? By contrast, these older women, they're egg-free. <laughs> that's, that's what we should say. I'm not menopausal, I'm egg-free. <laughs> or cage-free, even better. Which brings us to the final question, the final biological question, right? Unlike males, females can make babies and then stop making them, but live several decades longer, mostly outliving the men. Why? What's the biological purpose? You know, it's really interesting because now there's fascinating new scientific research, specifically on killer whales, that suggests 
that suggest that menopause may be nature's way of prolonging the longevity and health of grandmothers who have a wealth of memories, knowledge, and caregiving experience so that those grandmothers can alloparent and lead their pods or tribes. Which brings us to this election season. <laughs> which will be done in 10 days, thank God. Okay, okay, so consider, they used to say that we couldn't have a woman president because once a month she'd go mad and hit the red button. <laughs> which has literally never happened in the history of humankind, particularly not with a menopausal woman who, like almost half of us, does not have that time of the month. No, when it comes to politics and hormones, the real liability isn't estrogen, it's testosterone, right, the groping hormone. Okay, okay. that was not right, that was... No, 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 okay. It doesn't matter which side of the aisle you sit on. You know, it's, it's been clear that in our national conversation recently about leadership, it's been amazing how much of it has been subsumed by these runaway tales of testosterone misfiring. Right? <laughs> so maybe Mother Nature is suggesting it's time for a change. It's for our archetypes of world leaders, instead of an overgrown boy, how about a steady, experienced grandmother? <laughs> huh? Hashtag menopause nation. Okay. Regardless, for women, evolutionarily, it's our time right now. Our time to tell our own stories, person to person, across generations, like the beautiful stories we've heard all day as we continue to age and grow and thrive in this exciting time of planetary hot flash, power surge, the best kind of global warming. <laughs> in short, people, welcome to the Estro Revolution, <laughs> AKA the change. Liberation is here, the future is female. But don't worry, world, as we like to say, there won't be blood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.